all-sufficient Mary, shining like the sun, a fortune I inherit by no work I have done, my righteousness I forfeit at my Savior's cross. We're all sufficient merit, did what I could not. In love he condescended, eternal now in time, a life without a made to die the law could never save us our lawlessness had won until the pure and spotless them had finally come it is done
happy resurrection day he is risen i am so happy to be with you today to be able to worship with you as we begin i do want to just highlight um, our young adults are going to be starting a study by jl packer called calling affirming the apostles creed all of the details for that you will find on church center under groups but they're going to have a good time going through this um, we actually had the privilege a couple of years ago of going through a sermon series on the Apostles' Creed. And in thinking about that heading into today, uh, there's a line in there that says, he was, he died, he crucified, was died and was buried. He descended into hell and on the third day, he rose again from the dead. This is what makes today special. This is what is the absolute foundation of our faith. Um, in thinking, I've been drawn to 1 Corinthians 15. And in there, um, verses 12 through 19, Paul's arguing with some of the believers there who didn't believe in the resurrection. And he's telling them, you know, if you don't believe in the resurrection, we're essentially liars as we've been preaching to you. Your faith means nothing. Everything that you do is in vain. You're still in your sins. But then verse 20, he says, but in fact... Christ was raised from the dead. That's why we're here. That is why we worship him this morning. We get the privilege this morning, too, of witnessing two baptisms. It is so exciting that we get to see here the testimonies of these new believers. We get to see them symbolically identify with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. You guys, this is just such a great, such a great resurrection morning. Would you guys all stand and join me in prayer before we start our worship? Lord, we come to you today with hearts full of gratitude. We thank you for your death on the cross for our sin. We thank you for your victory over that death. Lord, that we might have eternal life with you. You promise us in Romans that if we confess in that you're Lord and the believe that you raised him from the dead, we will be saved and we thank you for that. Lord, help us to walk in the power of the resurrection daily and to share that hope around us with everyone that we know. Lord, be with us now. Help our hearts to be in worship now and throughout the week as we worship you, Lord, because you are the only one who was resurrected from the dead. We thank you are worthy of it. Amen. He is our firm foundation. His resurrection brings us new life. Let's sing to him. Christ is my firm foundation. You 
let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We're going to sing of that merit that God gives us. The merit that only Jesus has, truly. That he came, that he chose to die to take on our sins. And now we get to enjoy life with him because of his resurrection, because of his glory. Let's sing together. All sufficient merit, shining like the sun. A fortune I inherit by no work I have done. My righteousness I
1 to 10. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. He's risen. stand for the next 40 minutes. Whenever we read those verses in John 10, there's a little bit of like disjointedness if you're reading it in, in sequence with the rest of the gospel. Because you're, you just read about the horrific death and torture of Jesus, and then they buried him, and then he's gone. And even though we've probably read that story a hundred times, however long you've been a Christian, or maybe you've never read it before, but you get to that point and you're like, wait, I'm pretty sure he was dead, and now he's not. There's, there's this dissonance that, that can occur if we allow ourselves to sort of in, enter into that narrative. We can't ignore it, and we can't pretend it's not there. And the reason that we can't ignore it is because the tomb is actually empty. Amen. Right? Like, Jesus died, and he was buried, and yet that tomb is empty. And so when we come to that, we can say, listen, I don't believe that, or I don't want to believe that, or I'm not sure about that. But at the end of the day, the last piece of evidence that we have is the fact that there's nothing in that tomb. Like, the tomb is still empty. There's not suddenly like, oh, we figured out where Jesus was really buried. No, 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 it's empty. And so we have to address that. We, have to, we can either accept that as a fact and believe that, or we can sort of fight against that, but we still have to deal with that fact. Wherever we're at on our, our faith journey, wherever we're at emotionally, we can't pretend that that doesn't exist. L looking back at, at what John and Peter did, right? In verse 8, it says the other disciple, that's going to be John. He doesn't refer to himself in his gospel. But he says the other disciples who had reached the, the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture. He doesn't understand. He doesn't know, but he believes. So what did he believe? Like what, <laughs> if, he doesn't, if he doesn't understand, why, how does he believe? I think at a base level, we could say, well, he believed that the women had said that the tomb was empty and that that was true. That's certainly a part of it. But I, I think there's a positiveness to that where he's, he recognized the fact that God was still in control and God was still working in spite of the fact that he didn't know what it was. So he didn't fully comprehend. He didn't know the scriptures well enough to be able to say, oh, yeah, no, this was definitely predicted. But he still believed that whatever God was doing was, was sort of still in progress. My big idea for this morning is this. Believing in Jesus changes everything. The condition for that, though, is that you have to actually believe. You can't kind of think that maybe you're going to give this a shot. You can't kind of halfway enter in and be like, well, maybe, but let's just see. That attitude doesn't change everything. Actually believing that Jesus is resurrected, that's the thing that changed everything. That's the content of the belief that actually is life-changing. So I'm going to pick up where, where we left off in, in verse 11. So John chapter 20 started in verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stood to, stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head, one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, 
Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said the things to her. We see Mary move from sorrow, like her own personal sorrow, to belief. That's, that's the journey. So she was at a place in her life where she didn't have anything but sorrow, but because she saw Jesus, she was able to transition that into belief. When you look at Mary Magdalene's life through the, through the Gospels, man, she was a mess before Jesus. She's not the first one, she's not the last one, but for sure she was a mess. Like she, the, the, the scripture that we have is that she was possessed by seven demons. Like that's just kind of the short thing. So when, she, when Jesus frees her, we don't know like exactly how that worked its way out, but we do know that she was kind of a disaster and Jesus rescued her from that. Jesus threw out the demons and she immediately decided to follow Jesus. And she was one of the really, really close followers of Jesus. It seems like she kind of latched on and lo- locked in and like that was, that was her entire life. I, she probably wasn't there when Jesus talked about, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? It, it was probably just the, the 12 disciples that were there at that point. But if she would have been there, she would have just been like, yes, obviously you're the way, the truth, and the life. Why are these guys struggling with that? Like, this is so obvious, of course, right? Like that, that seems to be who she was, where whatever Jesus said, she was absolutely sure that was right. And so Jesus' death would have unraveled her in a way that maybe not many people could have experienced. And and she doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know where to turn. She's just overwhelmed by her grief. But when she sees Jesus, that radically changes. Right? She She moves from grief, she moves from her sorrow into, oh, this is Jesus And she recognized that and she had faith. She believed in Jesus and that changed that sorrow. It's hard to move from grief to faith. When we're overwhelmed, like you look at at Mary and she was there and she's crying and she's overwhelmed and she doesn't actually recognize Jesus right away. Like it's not until he says something to her, he says her name, that she's like, oh, this is actually Jesus. Her, Her brain wasn't working all the way because... Like, she was so overwhelmed with her grief. And I think we can sometimes be in that space as well, where we're, the thing that's in front of us is overwhelmingly sad or breaks our heart or causes us so much emotional pain that we can't get through that to focus on Jesus. What grief am I struggling with that Jesus wants to transform into faith? What's the brokenness in my life that Jesus wants me to be able to move past? Because what happens is when Jesus rises from the dead, he he sort of takes away the underlying causes for grief. Whatever the grief is that you're dealing with, ultimately the resurrection will fix that. It may not feel like it now, it may, may not look like it right now, but ultimately the resurrection fixes that. Right? If our sorrow is in our own physical brokenness in the here and now, we we're sick. You know, someone that we love is sick, whatever, whatever that is, or if it's a separation, a death, whatever that thing is that causes us grief, ultimately Jesus is going to come back as the resurrected Savior and he's going to undo all of that. He's going to make all of that right and we can ultimately live away from grief, right? It says in Revelation that he's going to wipe the tears from our eyes and that there's not going to be any more sorrow. And so the fact that Jesus rose from the dead means that that's the thing that we look forward to. And it might be hard, And we might struggle in the here and now with it. But ultimately, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead takes that away. And so if we can truly see Jesus as a resurrected Savior, if we can truly live in that truth, then then we move from grief into belief. And we're going to keep looking at sort of the reactions that people need to, to move into belief. And so in in verse 19, Mary did what Jesus asked her to do. She obeyed. Jesus asked her to go tell the disciples. She does that. 
Verse 19, then the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And so we, we see in this section that the disciples move from fear to belief. Like they start off, they're afraid, and now suddenly they've, they've found faith. Mary announces to them that Jesus is still alive. That doesn't quite click. Right? Like they're in this upper room and they're afraid. And honestly, it's legit that they're afraid. When, when you look at the disciples' fear, Jesus was killed because he was theoretically going to try and lead an uprising, right? Like, they said he was the king of the Jews. That was the fake charges that they had moved against him with. And so when Jesus was executed, that, the point of that was, we're going to stop this from becoming a revolution. If you kill the leader of the revolution, you're not going to leave all the guys that were following them alone. You're going to make sure that those guys get handled as well. So... This is Sunday morning. For them, Sunday would have been the first work day of the week. And so it's probable that if they're going to get arrested, it's going to be that day, right? So Jesus was killed at the beginning of a holiday weekend. So the police force kind of said, okay, we'll, we'll give them the weekend to hide. And then on, on Sunday morning, which for us would have been Monday, we're going to go out and we've got, you know, full force again, and we'll just go and we'll arrest them all. That would have been what the disciples were thinking. So if they're hiding with doors locked, because they're afraid they're going to be arrested, they're pretty sure it's today. And so they're terrified. And then, in spite of that fear, in spite of the locked doors, in spite of the fact that no one should have been able to sneak up on them on a, without them realizing it, Jesus is just sort of standing in the middle. It's like, hey guys, how you doing? <laughs> right? He says, peace be on you, which was sort of a common greeting at that time similar to the way that we would say, hey, what's up? Or how you doing? Except for in the same way that sometimes we say, how you doing? And we don't mean it. Or sometimes we say it and we, we really do mean it. Jesus doesn't just say, oh, peace to you. And then like he blows it off. No, he actually means like there is real peace for you. And they're like, oh, this is different. And so this is when it finally clicks for the disciples. Oh, Jesus is here and he's announcing that we have peace. Like, okay. I guess we're good <laughs> because Jesus was arrested and killed and now he's not dead anymore. And we weren't really sure that we believed everybody else, but now that he's here physically, he can prove that he's him. I guess we're good. And so that the peace to you that Jesus says is more than just like, oh, hey, how you guys doing? It's actually, guys, you have peace with God. You don't have to be afraid because of your sin anymore. There's, there's all these things that Jesus' resurrection means that we have peace because of, right? We, we don't have to suffer the consequences for our sin. We don't have to necessarily uh, be afraid of that. We don't have to be afraid of the wrath of God. There's all these things that the peace of God comes from the resurrection of Jesus. And then that peace means that they're commissioned to go tell other people. Right? He says, the same way that, I, that God sent me, I'm now going to send you out into the world. They're sent and they're given the power to accomplish the mission that Jesus had for them. That's a pretty big move from we're hiding ourselves and locking ourselves in an upper room to suddenly like, nope, our job is to go out and proclaim this message. Where can the peace that Jesus offers me replace my fear. Because we can make that same transition. When we meet Jesus, we realize all the things that I might be afraid of, Jesus actually handled. Like, am I afraid of death? Jesus conquered death. Am I afraid of not being accepted? Jesus says that if I'll come to him in faith, he'll accept me regardless, right? So, so really, coming to Jesus is, it answers all my fears. I don't have to be afraid anymore. I can have peace with God, and that means that I can have the peace with the people around me because I know that what God has called me to is, is live that out. And so Jesus looks at my fear and he says, you don't have to be afraid anymore. You can have peace. 
And then from there, we, we realize that we're empowered to go and share that message. Verse 24, we're going to keep moving. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to, told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the marks of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, the disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And so we see Thomas move from skepticism to belief. You might have heard the phrase doubting Thomas. That's kind of a thing that people will throw around some of the time. This is where it comes, guys. <laughs> this, is, this is the origin of that. Although recently I started to have a little bit more empathy for Thomas. I had a Bible study with Youth for Christ and they were kind of, they really were pro-Thomas in that group. They were like, no, it's, it's legit that he doubted. And so I kind of had to reconsider my, my frustrations with Thomas. I, here's the part that struck me. Okay, Mary sees Jesus. Mary goes to the disciples. The disciples have already heard from, from Peter and John that Jesus isn't in the tomb. Mary says, I've seen the Lord. And what's their response? Whatever, Mary. We're not listening to you. Thomas isn't there. A week later, Thomas is like, I don't believe you guys. And they're like, he's the doubter. Like, the rest of us believed a week ago when we saw Jesus. He hasn't seen Jesus. You're like, cut him some slack, guys. Like, he, he wanted the same evidence that the rest of you had. Also, I appreciate Thomas because I have just enough Gen X in me to be like, I'm a little cynical. I'm, I'm okay with that. And honestly, this isn't the first time that we've seen Thomas be a little bit cynical. If you go back to, to John chapter 11, you don't have to turn there, but Jesus is, is headed to near Jerusalem to, to be with Lazarus. Lazarus died and he was going to raise him from the dead. And all the disciples are like, don't go back. They're trying to kill you. If you go back there, they're definitely going to find you and they'll probably kill you. And Jesus is like, nope, I'm going to go. I'm going to go raise Lazarus from the dead. And so in John chapter 11, verse 16, so Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. A little bit of a negative guy. That's just his outlook, right? Just based on those two pieces of information, I feel like Thomas was the guy that was, you know, kind of double checking everything that Jesus did. Like the morning after Jesus walked in the water, he's like, hey, Jesus, can I see your sandals? I'm not sure that those are 100% normal, right? Or he's going to the blind guy that was healed and he's talking to his cousin. He's like, he was really blind, right? Like this isn't a, he just didn't have his eyes closed, right? He was really blind. William Barclay said it this way. Thomas had two great virtues. He absolutely refused to say that he understood what he did not understand or that he believed what he did not believe. There is an uncompromising honesty about him. He would never still his doubts by pretending they did not exist, right? So Thomas's skepticism is at least honest, <laughs> and, and it's, he, he's not going to pretend like he's got faith when he doesn't. So he heard the witness of all these friends, and he was still skeptical. He's like, no, I actually want to experience what you experienced before I believe the way that you believe. There is something in Jesus' warning, though, that I think we have to be careful with, Jesus says, don't be unbelieving, but believe. There was a line that Thomas came up to, <laughs> maybe crossed a little bit, didn't quite cross. There's a line there where we have to be careful of how far we're willing to carry our doubts, right? And I'm not sure exactly where that line is. I think that's different for different people. But there's a point where we shift from, I doubt, I'm not sure, I'm wrestling with this, to, no, I don't believe. Let me try to explain it this way. Doubts are struggles with something that you actually believe. So if you're saying, I think I believe in Jesus, but there's these things that I've been taught that I'm not sure of, or there's these parts of scripture that I'm still wrestling with, 
or I'm not sure about the whole thing, that, those are doubts. Those are things that you can struggle with. We can work through those. We can talk about those. We can address those. We can say, okay, these are things I'm struggling with, but let's move in this direction, right? So that, those are doubts. And those are legit because we're, we're sinners. And so I know that I don't understand everything perfectly, and I know that you don't understand everything perfectly, and I have a non-infinite mind, right? Like, I'm, I'm a person, I'm a human being. I can't understand everything that God has said or is or does. And some things are just confusing. And so all of those mean that doubts are just a normal part of the Christian life. We, we struggle with them at times. Sometimes we feel, nope, I don't have any doubts at all. Other times we kind of wrestle through them. That, that's normal. That's a part of growing in Christ. Unbelief is something different. That would be just a basic rejection, right? That saying, I'm not, I don't believe anymore. I'm done. I, it's not that I'm wrestling with this. I'm, I'm not wrestling with this. I don't believe. And we might say, sometimes we say, oh, I doubt this or I'm struggling with this, when we actually have just a base level of I don't believe. And there's nothing that you can do to convince me. And so unbelief is something that we actually need to repent of. That's something where we've set, we have as a base uh, focus, I'm not accepting what God has said. I don't believe what God is doing. The answer is just no. So I'm not allowing God to address my doubts, even if he's willing to. I'm not struggling with them in good faith. I've already made my decision, and the answer is no. So we see that sort of separation, and I, I pull that out because I think different of us are in different spots. Like, we, we all have doubts, and, and there's some of us that are, have moved maybe into unbelief. I think it's interesting, and I don't think this is the primary application, but I do think it's interesting that Thomas's doubts occur when he's by himself. Thomas doesn't wrestle with doubt in the community. He wrestles with doubt when he's away. Right? So the first time when Jesus shows up and Jesus appears to the disciples, Thomas isn't there. He's off by himself. And so then he's not really sure, he's not really as comfortable with it as the rest of them are. There's something about isolation that tends to turn doubts toward unbelief. And I know that's hard because when we're doubting, when we're struggling, it's really hard for us to kind of come forward and be like, this is what I'm wrestling with. I'm not 100% sure. It's hard to just admit that to a community of believers. Even if it's just a couple of close friends, we don't want to be honest with that. And yet, isolating ourselves with our doubts is kind of the most sure path toward unbelief. If we wrestle with our doubts honestly within the community, we have the conversations a lot of times we can move to, to sort of resolve our doubts. If we refuse to do that, if we isolate ourselves, the path tends to be just towards unbelief. And, and it's not a one-to-one. -one. I don't want to make like a hard, fast statement. Like I said, I don't think this is the point of this passage. It's just a correlation that I've noticed in, in Christianity like I said, we all have doubts. And the people that I've noticed that struggle with doubts and isolate themselves to wrestle with their doubts tend to not come back. And the people that are honest with their doubts and deal with their doubts with other believers that, that have faith and they're willing to wrestle through those things, those people tend to come back to, to the, the community of believers. So if we don't address our doubts, if we let them run the show and we isolate ourselves, we're going to tend toward unbelief. I think a secondary piece of that, so I'm not a secondary application of a secondary application, so bear with me, okay? As a community of the people of God, we probably need to be a little bit more gracious to people that are struggling with doubts because we recognize that they are wrestling with things and we need to just be honest, be like, hey, you're wrestling with that, that's okay, I still love you, Jesus still loves you, we'll walk through that together. And just be open with that and recognize that what they really need is to be surrounded by a loving community. You'll notice Jesus' response isn't that he yells at Thomas, right? Like Jesus, Thomas is like, I won't believe unless I stick my finger in his hand. And Jesus is like, okay, Thomas, if that's what it's going to take you to believe, here you go. Jesus is willing to engage with what he doubts in order to, to restore him to the community. And I think that's, that's 
really a beautiful picture of just the grace and love that Jesus has towards all of us, right? He, he's not going to throw us out just because we're struggling with something. He's like, no, let's address that. Let's deal with that. Welcome back to the family. What's the doubt that I need to bring to Jesus? What's the thing that I'm wrestling with a little bit, or maybe a lot, that I need to bring back to Jesus? Now, maybe you've moved fully to unbelief. I don't know. And if you have, that's actually okay. You can come back from that if you're willing to repent. Like, that's kind of the key piece. But I suspect for a lot of us, it's not that full-scale unbelief. We are in church on Easter. At some level, you're here, right? So I, I think there's a lot of pieces of, I'm not sure about this. I'm not positive about this. I'm wrestling with part of this. And, and what do we need to do to, to make sure that that's in the open with the community of believers and, and we're wrestling with that honestly? Honestly, we start there with, with just praying, bringing it to Jesus, being like, Lord, I'm, I'm not sure about this. I'm struggling with this. If you've got a life group, I'd encourage you to be in a life group. If you have one, talk to them about it. I know all the life group leaders. None of them are people that are going to be angry and accuse you, right? If, if you don't have a life group and you want to reach out, you can email me. There's, there's an email we'll have at the end, respond at lbchapel.org. You can email me. I'd love to walk with you through this. I don't yell at people individually. I usually yell big groups. It's a personality thing. In Mark 9, there's a dad that brings his son to Jesus to be healed. And he's kind of wrestling with this same thing. And Jesus kind of pushes back on him when he says, like, oh, Lord, if you're, if you're able, you need to heal my son. And Jesus kind of says, like, do you really believe? And the dad, and this is beautiful, the father says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Like, he recognizes that he's struggling with a piece of this, and he, he just brings it to Jesus. He's like, I don't have all of this figured out, Lord. you got to help, right? And that's the attitude that we need to have, whether it's doubt, whether it's unbelief, whatever it is, just bring it to Jesus and say, hey, I'm wrestling with this. You, you need to fix this for me. Because we can bring it to Jesus and ask him to replace our unbelief or our doubt with real faith. And as we do that, we wrestle with our doubts in community, then suddenly we can walk and move from that skepticism, from that doubt that we're struggling with into belief. Keeping going with that, that same thought, in verse 29, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. A lot of times we end the story of Thomas in verse 29. And so it kind of feels like Jesus is kind of slapping him on the wrist, like, oh, you should have believed. But I think really Jesus is looking past Thomas to all of us and saying, listen, there's a whole, you know, there's dozens and dozens of generations of people that will believe without seeing, and I want them to know that that's legit. Like, that's for real. And so that's why John writes his gospel. The gospel is there so that we can believe. We can see what Jesus did, we can understand what he did, and we can actually follow in that path of, of belief. We're blessed because we have believed even though we haven't seen. And, and Thomas's confession, you're the Christ, the Son of God, that's, that's the focus point of John's gospel. That's why he gives this little epilogue here. He's actually saying really specifically like, hey, this is the point, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. When we look at this for the, through these first couple of verses, there's two points that I want to make. The first is that actually belief is the first goal of just the gospel. It's the first goal of Jesus rising from the dead, right? Like it's that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Belief is not a mental exercise. We have this idea that we, we're like mentally assenting is what belief is. But the reality is that it's more than that. But it starts with a mental assent. Like that's the first step, even though that's not all of it. And so John sort of gives this whole record of Jesus. He starts off in John chapter 1. If you read the Gospel of John, he starts off in verse 1 with, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, he was in the beginning with God. So John's first, the first thing that John says in his Gospel, Jesus is God. 
And then if you skip down to verse 14 in John chapter 1, he says, And the word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John started his whole gospel with the focus of Jesus is God come in the flesh. That's the point of John's gospel, that we recognize that and that we believe it. It's really important for John, to John that we recognize that Jesus isn't just some guy. He's God. And then in, in chapter 3, verse 16, John gives the point of his gospel. He said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And so when we look at Jesus through the eyes of John, we start to think about, okay, if he's God and he came in the flesh and he did that to save us, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean for me? And, and so the starting point of our faith is recognizing Jesus is God, that he came in the flesh and that he died on the cross, not just because he had to, but because he loved us and he wanted to pay the price for our sin. And so belief is looking at that and being like, yeah, I believe that. I'm going to allow that to change my life. Right? That, that's what Christianity starts with. And so we, we started off our lives as, as rebels with no natural inclination for God, toward God. We didn't want to be a part of his family. We were away from him. And Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection means that we now can, can see him for what he is. And when we accept him by faith, we have forgiveness of sin and we're joined into the family of God. We become disciples. The way that the, the, those guys in that upper room were disciples, the way that they saw Jesus, we're still disciples. We follow Jesus the way that they did. And so we come to Jesus in faith, we confess our sin, and we commit to following him. If you've never done that, I'm going to invite you to do that this morning. At the end of the service, like not quite the end of the service, before the baptism, I'm going to pray and I'd invite you to, to join me with that. If you were paying attention in, in John 20, 31, you'll notice that the goal of belief is something beyond that, right? That by believing, you might have life through his name. So life for John is a much bigger category, right? So it's, it's we believe but that belief leads to a changed life. It's not just that I believe and then like, yeah, okay, now I'm, I'm good for the rest of the week. It's that I believe and that actually changes my life, that, that God dwells with me, that I have a relationship with him and he now changes everything about me. Warren Wearsby says it this way, historical faith says Jesus lives, saving faith says Christ lives in me. So if we accept Jesus as our Savior, that's a one-time thing. But then what happens from that is that it starts to leak out into all the areas of our lives. We start to actually change, not the world around us, but our perspective on everything changes because we've been changed by God. The good news that Jesus died, buried, and rose from again and now reigns and rules in heaven has personal implications for me. It changes my life. So when I say believing in Jesus changes everything, I don't mean that the world is radically different automatically as soon as I believe. I mean that I'm radically different. So Jesus' resurrection offers me the opportunity to move from sorrow to belief. Right? When I'm overwhelmed by grief, when I'm overwhelmed by my own brokenness, my own sinfulness, my own sickness, something around me in the world that's broken or shattered, I recognize that, that causes me pain and grief. I'm not overwhelmed by that because I know Jesus rose from the dead and conquers that. And I can move from sorrow to belief. Right? When I meet Jesus, I can move from fear to belief. I don't have to be afraid because I know Jesus is God. He came to earth. He died on the cross, and he's going to ultimately rule and reign over all of the earth. Everything's going to be fixed, and I don't have to be afraid because I know that that's the end of the story. I have peace. I can rest in his goodness because of what he has accomplished on the cross and also because of what he's going to do. And I can move from my unbelief and my skepticism into just faith and trusting in Jesus. When I struggle with doubt, when I struggle with unbelief, I can look to Jesus and the community of the people around me and say, I, 
I don't believe, but I, I want to believe. Help me believe, Lord. And, and ultimately, that leads to, uh, to us being in a place where we can say with Thomas, my Lord and my God. So I'm going to close in prayer. As I close in prayer, uh, I am going to lead a prayer that just simple faith of if you've never accepted Christ, you can follow me and pray with me and, and come talk to me if you do that. But I'll do that. After that, we're going to have a baptism. <laughs> it's a big morning. It's Easter. I love this. Um, <laughs> after that, we're going to have a baptism. After the baptism, uh, Randy and Teresa are going to be down here in the front. If you're struggling with unbelief or grief or anything, if there's anything in your life that you're struggling with, come on down, talk to Randy and Teresa. They would love to pray with you. Um, yeah, and also if you, if you do pray along with me and you commit, come talk to me, come talk to Randy and Teresa. Don't keep that to yourself. Again, faith is something that really grows in community. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you for the gift of repentance and the gift of faith. Lord, if there's anyone out here who has never trusted you, I just pray that they would look to you, that they would place their faith in you, that they would just recognize that, that we are sinners and that we need you to, to, in order to have a relationship with, with God. If there's anyone here that doesn't, I just invite you to pray with me. Lord, I'm a sinner, I'm lost, and I need you. I confess my sin, I'm sorry, Jesus, come into my life and change it. I want to believe. I pray this in your name. As they're preparing for that baptism just behind me, we're going to stand together. We're going to sing to Jesus. He's risen from the grave. He has already won for us new life. He's already won for us the ability to come into that relationship with him that Nate was just talking about. The first line says, there's a peace that outlasts darkness, hope that's in the blood, future grace that's mine today that Jesus Christ has won. He's already won the battle. Let's worship him. Your spirit is 
is my help. He'll fix my eyes on Jesus Christ. I'll say that it is well. Oh, I know that it is well. on Resurrection Sunday. Amen. And uh, so one at a time, Jim is going to read the testimonies of Ryan and April, and then I'm going to fully immerse them in water in what is known as believer's baptism. And this is a celebratory moment. So after each baptism, please clap and cheer. If you want to take photos, come on up a little bit closer. You can do that. And then after the service, please greet them and celebrate with them. Now baptism, it doesn't, it doesn't save a person. We're saved by our faith in what Jesus did for us on the cross. Baptism doesn't wash away sin, not in this water here. Only Jesus' blood does that. And baptism isn't required to be saved, to go to heaven. Only accepting Jesus as our Savior does that. Romans 10, 9, Heather already quoted it this morning. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's what Resurrection Sunday is all about today. Glad to be able to celebrate. But what baptism does do, and this is why we do it, because in the Bible, God told us to do it. Uh, Jesus modeled it for us by being baptized himself. And really, it's a public declaration that we have accepted Jesus as our Savior. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and the Holy Spirit. All right. Um, go ahead and read April's testimony. It said Ryan up there, but it's April first. <laughs> this is April's Rudish's testimony. Before accepting Christ, I carried around a lot of bitterness jealousy, anger, and hate. I was scared, lost, and just floating through life. Growing up, religion was not a part of my household. I had no religious family members or friends. I have spent the majority of my life not knowing anything about God. Scripture was, and still can be, confusing for me. I attended church a handful of times, but was never able to connect. My husband has always claimed to be religious, but it wasn't until we lost his uncle, who was a devoted Christian, to COVID, that he started taking his beliefs seriously. His devotion brought me to Christ, and since allowing Christ into my life, I have found a sense of peace and love. I am learning to forgive others, and in placing my faith in Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. I am learning to be patient, kind, and how to pray for others. I still have a lot to learn, but I am here today to declare to the church and the whole world that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Take a quick peek out here, April. This is your church family. They love you and they care about you. I'm going to ask you, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? I did. Have you, are you relying completely on his sacrifice on the cross for your salvation? I did. I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised again in the of The 
This is a testimony of Ryan Rudish. I was baptized, baptized in quotes, as an infant. Growing up, I believed in God, but the Catholic Mass and sacraments went over my head. I didn't know much about God or how to connect with him and eventually stopped going to church. I didn't make any further efforts to follow him or learn about him. As I got older, I still claimed to be a Christian. However, I had never read the Bible. Eventually, I said to myself, how can I say I follow the Word of God when I don't know the Word of God? I was content in my hypocrisy for a good while, but my heart was already set on a course towards God. Every week, the urge to get a Bible and read it grew and grew, and every week I put it off until I could no longer resist. I bought a Bible and started reading Matthew, and after reading the Sermon on the Mount, I truly believed. I went through a period of not knowing if I should be baptized again, but after reading the New Testament completely, it says to believe and then to be baptized. Since infants don't believe anything, I'm here to say once and for all that Christ is Lord, and that I believe that he died for my sins and God raised him from the dead. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to tell you the same thing. These folks are, we're your church family. We care about you guys. We love you. Um, you and I are going to have to work together on this one here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> have you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? I have. Now you're relying completely on his sacrifice and the cross for your salvation. I have. Baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. This is really, this is a huge day, you know, celebrating the Lord's resurrection, celebrating people devoting their lives, giving their lives to Christ, publicly declaring it. This is an exciting time. Let's stand together. We're going to finish off today by worshiping him, by singing to him. We know how the story ends. You know, this public declaration, we're all also declaring this here. We know with faith in Christ, we know how the story ends. We will be with him. We actually get to be with him now, but we will be with him in person, fully present with him together forever. He's our savior, our defense. There is no fear in life or death. Let's sing to him. the story ends we will be with you again you're my savior my defense no more fear in life or death the story ends. We will be with you again. You're my Savior, my defense. No more
celebrate the resurrection of our Lord this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, for the end of today, this Resurrection Sunday, our worship gathering here, it's not the end of the day yet. It's still, we still got plenty of rest of the day to go. But uh, continue to worship him in light of recognizing his death, burial, resurrection, the new life that brings us. If you, as you leave here today, have uh, anything that you would like to ask Nate or any of the pastor elders here at Lakeside, please go to uh, email respond at lbchapel.org and uh, they will respond to you quickly. And, uh, you know, we just want to get to know you. We want to understand how we can support you and help you find and follow Jesus. Today, if you're here and you have questions or you want to pray with someone for whatever reason, uh, Therese and Randy are down here and they will remain here so that you can come and pray with them uh, to, to, again, get that support that you need. If you would like to give to Lakeside, uh, we have online at Church Center. We have a little button on our Church Center app that says give. You can also go to lbchapel.org slash give. Or we've got a box in the back at the hub. There's a big old sign that says the hub. Can't miss it. It's a black box if you want to give there uh, in person today. As you leave today, again, in the recognition of our Lord's death, burial, and powerful resurrection that brings us new life, leave now knowing that he loves you and uh, he will never leave you nor forsake you. And let's carry that good news out into the world. You are dismissed. Thanks for joining us this morning uh, for worship. I'm Nate. I'm the lead pastor here at Lakeside Bible Chapel, and I'd love to connect with you. If you need prayer or you need to know what it means to follow Jesus, send us a message using the email in the description. Uh, if you'd like to give to Lakeside, there's a link to do that as well. We'd love for you to come out and join us in person. We think that, that in-person worship is really important. Uh, so do that if you're ever in the area. Uh, I hope today's service was helpful for you as you try to follow Jesus.